Hello and welcome to this episode of Pause with Nandini on NRI Affairs. Today's guest has had a profound impact on my life and the lives of many others. Um, I am so pleased to welcome Nitya Shanti on our show. And as some of you may know, um, Nitya Shanti's book, Unburden, uh, was something that I worked with, uh, worked with him on. It's got a lot of his teachings told in the most beautiful, simple way. Um, and I will begin with a little introduction and then we'll jump right into it. Um, so Nitya Shanti is an internationally acclaimed teacher. Um, he did his MBA from XLRI and then he moved on to become a forest monk for six years. And he lived in Thailand, in India and in Sri Lanka, in the US. And at some point, um, I think he was guided to, to live, learn and serve in broader ways than the traditional role of a monk allowed. So he stepped out of his robes and he began traveling around the world. And I'm very fortunate that on one of those travels, he came to Singapore where I first encountered him and his teachings. And very quickly, um, I'd like to say that two of the things that really drew me to his teachings was that one, you could come to them exactly as you were. There was no compulsion to be anything but yourself. And the second thing was that while he was teaching and drawing on ancient traditions, contemporary teachers, so much of his own wisdom and insight, he was always, and he, he still always encourages everyone to test those teachings in the crucible of their lived experience. And I think just that, that agency that you, you always have, I found very freeing and very powerful. Um, so thank you for all of that. And today what we have planned is that although Nitya has done thousands of interviews, which are in a question answer format, today I thought we'd do a little bit of a word association play. Um, just Nitya, if you'd like to say hello and then we'll begin. Yeah, happy to be here. Thank you for having me on the show, uh, Nandini. And I just want to say that people are so they have so many options of where to spend their time these days. And if some of them are watching this show, then my intention is that they get something of true value, something that makes them reflect on their life in a way they probably haven't before. And uh, whatever length of time they watch this, uh, then they get a sense of, you know, something settles inside of them and uh, gives them a certain direction in their life. I like to start these conversations with a bit of an intention. And that's my intention, that everyone gets a kind of settling feeling and a kind of clarity. And uh, with that, let's get started. Lovely. Thank you for that. So in this word association game, there will be either words or little phrases. And Nitya will choose to respond in any way that he sees fit. It could be a word. It could be an explanation. Um, all of these are drawn from life and also some from his teachings. I begin with one word that comes up a lot in the community. Not a word, but a phrase. Why me? <laughs> yeah, why me is uh, a tendency to feel that you're a victim and feel like everyone's against you, life is against you. Sometimes you even feel like you're against you. Because I had that in the beginning. I felt that, why can't I live what I know? Why is there a gap between my knowing and my living? Even things I know I like, I'm not able to live them. Uh, and the best answer I found for why me is, uh, why not? <laughs> and uh, it is the way it is. I mean, we don't know why it is the way it is. One thing we find is that we tend to overemphasize our own challenges, but everyone has challenges. Someone has health challenges, someone has family challenges, someone has financial challenges, someone doesn't like their height, or someone doesn't like the shape of their uh, nose. And we've all got different things. And even the people who we imagine have got it all, they've got different things to worry about. So the best shift from why me is why not. And you can go one step further and say, bring it on. And this takes a kind of, this is what I call a shift from spiritual warrior to spiritual warrior. Spiritual warrior is praying and they please, I don't want anything bad to happen to me or praying, meditating. And the spiritual warrior says, bring it on. Because what I resist will persist. And what I welcome is never a problem. So this attitude of welcoming, radical welcoming, and a sense of trusting that whatever is showing up in your life is there for a reason, 
It's not here to break you. It's here to make you. This is something we have to learn and it's a very powerful way to go through life. Is that a very long answer to your word association? I can give shorter answers if required. I think, okay, it's a, I think it's also a good way to start. Okay, good. A bit yeah, of good. More, more context. From why me, let's go to impermanence. Impermanence was something that I was introduced to in a very strong way when I began meditating. The form of meditation I learned is called Vipassana. Uh, back then when I was 16, 17 years old. And the main teaching of Vipassana is to recognize the impermanent nature of things. So impermanence, the word in Pali language is anicca, or in Sanskrit it will be anitya. In fact, my name is nitya, and the meaning, meaning anitya, not, not stable, not eternal, constantly changing. And to recognize this, to have the experience of this in a direct way, not just in an intellectual way, everything changes, but to directly experience my breath is changing. My thoughts are changing. My emotions are changing. Sensations are changing. Everything is constantly changing. And then what is, in a, in a world where everything is changing, strangely enough, change itself becomes a foundation. And this is something I began to realize early on. So in my experience, it is impossible to suffer in the same moment where you're recognizing change. It is impossible. You cannot have a recognition of change and suffering in the same moment, which is why that phrase, this too shall pass, it really connects with a lot of people. Yeah, this too shall pass. In that moment, at least you relax. Then again, next moment, you may get caught up. So what I learned is it's not enough to intellectualize impermanence. It has to be a living reality. For example, my teacher would say, any cup you have, in this case, it's a glass, uh, look at it as already broken. Why should we look at it as already broken? Because one day it will break. And if you look at it as already broken, you will not be so disappointed when it breaks. So the Buddha recommends, and again, some of you may not like this teaching, but the Buddha recommends every single day, you remind yourself that all that is mine, beloved and pleasing will become otherwise. So all your loved ones, all the things you have, the fact that you can taste food, you know, there comes a time when you can't taste so clearly. There comes a time when your teeth become loose. There comes a time when walking is hard. Things we take for granted right now, seeing clearly, hearing clearly. All that is mine, beloved and pleasing will become otherwise. will be separated from me. This is a bitter truth of life. And yet any bitter truth, when you embrace it, when you welcome it, it goes from being something that is caging you to something that is saging you. You start, you know, a part of you starts wisening up. And you can relax it down. You can be more graceful with it. So we've all met people who are quite graceful. Even in their old age, they're graceful. Even in tragedy, they're graceful. It's because at some deep level, they have recognized it is the way it is and not to resist the change. So impermanence is a very important teaching uh, in the Buddha's teaching and also in my own understanding. You cannot get to permanence unless you step into impermanence. The deeper you understand impermanence, you intuitively get a sense of what might be called permanent. But you cannot get that by just trying to imagine your way into some Brahman, into some stable state. You can't imagine your way into that. You have to walk through, you have to recognize the full domain of impermanence to get a taste of what is, de de what is genuinely stable. Beautiful. Play. <laughs> this was again a big insight for me that at some point I got really serious with spirituality and meditation. I got the whole... Uh, project of getting enlightened became such a heavy thing that was very refreshing for me to meet some of my teachers who were so light they were playful they would laugh a lot they would tell a lot of jokes one of our teachers told so many jokes that we had to, had to ask him you know that you know we can't we just can't stop laughing he said yes because when you're laughing your mouth is open and that's when I throw the wisdom pill <laughs> <laughs> so uh, then I realized that it doesn't have to be so heavy and uh, at the end of it, you actually start taking yourself lightly. You start taking everything more lightly. You start seeing it all more as more transparent, as not so, not so, such a big deal, actually. And there's a difference between I don't care and I don't mind. A subtle difference, but it's an important difference. So it's not that you don't care what's happening. Of course, people are suffering, people are struggling, but you don't mind what happens. How much of what we get troubled by is not even in our hands. Like world news is pouring into our homes. But what can you do about a war happening in a different land? What can you do about an earthquake that's happened? Yeah, you can send money or everything. But uh, 
wouldn't that attention be better served with the people around you, the people who are struggling in your home, the neighbors, the, the community you're living in, uh, instead of worrying about distant things all over the place? So it's important to lighten up and uh, wherever you're. So one of my hobbies actually is board games. So in fact, this before this call, we were playing a board game. And I find that lightens it up for me. It's good to balance out the profundity with the playfulness. There was a great saint of Kashmir, Goraknath. He said, somebody asked him his purpose of life, his teaching in life, what it's all about. And Goraknath said, Hasiba, Kheliba, Dhariba, Dhyana, which means I'm here to laugh, Hasiba. I'm here to play, Kheliba. And Dhariba, Dhyana, I'm here to meditate. And meditate in the broader sense is whatever I do, I do it wholeheartedly. Like if I'm, if I'm talking to you right now, let me talk wholeheartedly. Let me be fully here. And this is a very nice motto to go through life with. So play is definitely underrated, but highly important. Love it. Let's go to um, acceptance. Just yesterday, we had a session only focused on acceptance. And anytime you're hurting, anytime you're struggling, inwardly hurting, struggling, definitely you're not accepting something. Maybe you're not accepting something about yourself. You're not accepting how it feels. You're not accepting something about others, what they've done, or they should have done, or they could have done, and they're not doing. Not accepting something about life. Why is life this way? Life shouldn't be this way. God shouldn't be this way. At some, in, at some level, you're resisting. So acceptance is not only the foundation of healing and sanity. It is the entire framework for it. Every step of the way, we need acceptance. Acceptance is a hallmark of being in the present. Eckhart Tolle talks about three hallmarks. One is acceptance. So right now, if you accept this moment, then you are in the present. Second one would be enjoyment. Level two. Level one is acceptance. Level two is enjoyment. Level three is enthusiasm. And it is hard to always be in the state of, well, it's a nice ideal, but it's hard to always enjoy everything, to always uh, be enthusiastic about everything. That can even seem a little fake sometimes. But definitely acceptance. Acceptance. Mm -hmm. So let acceptance be our foundation. Uh, we had a relative who had advanced throat cancer and many other diseases, actually. She lived for quite a long time. She saw a very serious car accident. And there was a time when she lost her very strange disease. For a few days, she couldn't see, she couldn't hear, and she couldn't speak. Now, can you imagine? You can't see anything. You can't hear anything. You can't say anything. But she could move her hands and legs. But in a way, you come into your own bubble. But she was able to keep calm. She was living in Alaska and they had took her two, three days to get her to a proper hospital. But the whole time she couldn't see, she couldn't hear, she couldn't speak. At the most, she could make some signs with her hand. Now imagine a situation like that. But she kept her cool. And so the big lesson I learned from her is the simple teaching. She would often say this, it is what it is. It is what it is. It is what it is. And she was a master of acceptance. And at the end of her life, she had advanced throat cancer. At the end, she couldn't speak. And people have gathered, family have gathered around the last day of her life. She can't speak, but she can look into people's eyes. And she's winking at them. She's winking at them. She's been, I'm relaxed. I'm cool. All is well. She's squeezing the hand and she's winking at them. So acceptance will help us in life. It will help us in the final moments of life as well. And the simple mantra of acceptance is, it is what it is. It is what it is. Wow, that story will stay with me. That's powerful. Okay. Should we do... This okay, we'll do money first. Yeah. <laughs> I had something very I was thinking about the connection. I had shame and I had money. And I thought sometimes shame connects quite closely in strange ways with money. But we'll talk about money first. Money, first of all, is so innocent. You know, money is just an energy. Money is something we've devised to uh, exchange. I, I would actually call it the energy of appreciation. Money is the energy of appreciation. I appreciate some gift you have, some talent you have, some resource you have. And I'm willing to give you this gift of appreciation to receive that. So it is an exchange for value rendered at some level. So if you can take out the whole negative connotations of money, there are many beliefs which come with money. Oh, money uh, is an evil. Money by itself is not an evil. It's, it's as innocent as a child. Uh, yeah, sometimes it is used in, an, in, an, in a not a very clever or wise way. Maybe clever way, but not a very wise way. However, money by itself is innocent. So I like to see money as the energy of appreciation, the energy of blessings. 
and how i see money how i see anything in fact yatha drishti tatha srishti i am not seeing money or anything or anyone the way they are i am seeing it the way i am so if i have certain strong beliefs about money as not being good or or even as being the end all the be all and end all of life either way that's how it'll that's i like to prove that to myself so i think it's wonderful to have a very healthy relationship with money and as with all things let us have connection but let us also have some detachment so like i have i've had a chance to experience both sides of life i actually lived without money for 6 years i lived as a monk didn't even touch money for 6 years and lived in the gift economy so i'd walk out day walk out every day and get some food and that would be the food i ate for the day and uh, you realize how simple life can be you can you train yourself to live even at the root of a tree you train yourself to have one set of clothes you train you train yourself to uh, use whatever food you get for the day or rag robes you can stitch together cloths to make your cloth your clothes uh, you can um, so this is like the basics and this is freely available right so once you've tasted that then you realize that yeah then you can play the game of money but you're not so attached to it anymore so when i first began teaching i was hardly charging anything and i realized that people are equating the quality of my teaching with what i'm charging so that's interesting <laughs> so if i charge this much you assume my teaching also is this much so then i began playing the game of money so then i would uh, charge a lot and then suddenly people at different level were interested in my teachings and then sometimes i'd not charge or sometimes i'd be like just take a donation or sometimes i'd i'd give a voluntary like a like a slide i began very became very creative with it and uh, so i think all of us like with every relationship in our life with our siblings with our spouse with our, our parents it's something that requires maintenance our relationship with money also requires maintenance we should from time to time reevaluate what it is we believe about money look at what some of our friends think people we admire think, think about money and we can take on some of their beliefs wahe takeda the book written on him called maro up by ken honda great little book simple little book maybe less than 100 pages and the book talks about this man who he says money is like air and you got to breathe in and breathe out do you only breathe in and hold it that's going to suffocate you do you only breathe out and hold it that's going to suffocate you 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 breathe in and you breathe out in a balanced way so you receive and you give in a balanced way and this is a healthy relationship with money lovely shame shame comes from a very strong judgment about yourself something that you do or something that you think uh, you really believes there's a stain on you at some level which cannot be erased something you've done in the past or something you're doing in the present and there's a very deep sense of distaste dislike of yourself at a very fundamental level at some level this shame will go when you start realizing that did you choose this did you choose to be this way or are you just somehow this way and who decides you know as a society we decide uh, having one husband or wife is okay having two is not okay but there were times when it was okay marrying so- someone above this age is okay but below this age is not okay it's a very big shame after this birthday is fine but before this birthday is a very big shame at some level there are the man made rules that we are making right and if you look at the history of humanity we have been up to all kind of nonsense <laughs> from the beginning we've been up to all kind we've tried everything right <laughs> and i believe that just like the color of my skin the color of my eyes the color of my hair there's an element of genetics in this i am genetically i the certain height i have uh, the 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 kind of thing that i'm allergic to there's an element of genetics in this so i believe it doesn't stop only at the physical level i believe even the proclivities we have someone tends to be tending to steal stuff and you know, they like to they're greedy someone is jealous someone very easily angers uh, someone has a hard time keeping their commitments i feel it's not as as personal as we imagine i believe these are the traits of course that, that, that doesn't give you a free pass that you can oh that's just my parents or my grandparents or whatever it doesn't give you a free pass there will be consequences of everything you do but it does help to take it less personally that somehow i am like this and somehow life is like this and i find to the extent i have again coming back to acceptance i have accepted myself and i have seen that i am i am the full range of the part of me that is so bright and divine and clear and unconstrained and compassionate and all of that wise and there's a part of me that's totally caught up there's a part of me that really has a very hard time coming out of pattern i can embrace the full duality of that yeah. human and being 
right? The more I can embrace that, then it's not such a big deal anymore. And one goes through this life uh, without, uh, you know, what's that famous prayer? That I accept the things I cannot change. The, the, the serenity to accept, what is it? The serenity to accept the things I cannot change. And the, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. The wisdom to know the difference. And I think in that way, we can have uh, more compassion towards ourselves. Compassion is a good one. Compassion towards yourself, acceptance of yourself. And not getting fixated on one or two things. You know, it, it, you're, you're, you're a complex being. You have many qualities. Don't get fixated on one or two qualities. Mm. And when you focus, this is a good topic nowadays. They talk about focusing on your strengths. We should focus on our strengths. Don't obsess with the few things that are not going well. We have all the qualities. And don't try to define yourself either this or that. You are this and that and neither. You are somebody and everybody and nobody. This is a very strange thing to say. But it starts to make sense at some level. But yeah, at some level, I'm, I'm, I'm nobody. I can't define myself. At some level, I'm everybody. I have all the traits. Whoever I hang out with, I start getting associated with. It, it brings out different qualities in me. I'm everybody, I'm nobody, and I'm a somebody simultaneously. Mm. I find that a way to dissolve some of these strong emotions like shame. I have to ask you um, this word, which people most often equate with any kind of spiritual teacher, meditation. <laughs> meditation for me is agendaless, agendaless presence. Uh, meditation is an appointment with yourself. It's the date with yourself. And for me, more and more, meditation is not limited to a technique. Techniques are more like a gateway to meditation. It's like the prelude. It is mm. to actually, med techniques are to, de to deal with everything that's not meditation. Techniques are not meditation. Techniques are what help you deal with everything that comes in the way of you being comfortable in your own skin. So if there's a meditation I teach now, it's shikantaza, shikantaza, Japanese word for just sit, just sitting. So just sit. And so let, thoughts will come, thoughts will come, feelings will come, feelings will come, mind will wander, mind will not wander, you'll feel comfortable, you'll feel uncomfortable. And can you sit right in the middle of all of that? And uh, to me, this is meditation. And not even trying to attain any state. There's a nice phrase, Chogram Trimpa Rinpoche talked about, spiritual materialism. Earlier, we had the normal materialism of gathering you know, things, possessions, homes, uh, jewelry, uh, books, this and that. Normal materialism. Let me gather things. But even spiritual materialism, let me gather experiences. Oh, let me activate this chakra. Let me have this. Let me now have an out-of-body experience. Let me do remote viewing. Uh, <laughs> let me you know, have this siddhi, that siddhi. This is kind of spiritual materialism. Mm. And we may do it at a subtle level that, oh, I feel so peaceful when I meditate. But not always. Some days you're peaceful. Some days you're not. So it's nice to really have that open space. Concentration for me is exclusive. Meditation for me is inclusive. So include all of yourself, include all of life. Include your full humanity, include all your emotions, all your thoughts. And so in a way, meditation is pendulating. What does pendulating mean? You step back to witness your experience. And then you step in to feel what it's like to be this, in this body with these emotions. So you step back, step in, step back, step in. It's like an in-breath and an out-breath. If you only step back, you can get too detached. You can get indifferent. You can get disconnected. Then what's the point having a body at all? What's the point being in this world at all? If you get too embodied, then of course you get lost. You get totally caught up in your role. Oh, I'm a mother. Oh, I'm a father. Oh, I'm an employee. Oh, I'm a, this, I'm a business owner. And you get so caught up in that, that now it's become too tight again. So step back, step in, step back, breathe in, breathe out, step back, step in. And... Uh, at some level, it'll have to happen. We have to dissolve even the idea of meditation and let life in there. There's something called the 10 ox herding pictures of Zen. Maybe some of you can Google that, the 10 ox herding pictures. And so this man is basically step by step. There are 10 phases and the ox basically represents his mind. It's an unruly, unruly ox, but little by little, he trains his ox. And finally, a point comes and he merges with the ox. It's just a big circle. So the ox and him have merged. But that's not the final state. The final of the 10 ox herding pictures is the man is walking in the marketplace, which is a beautiful image that live your life, be in the marketplace, you know, mm. fulfill your roles, live a normal life. Don't try to stand out in any way. And right there, it is now fully integrated. The last step is not merging. The last step is 
living your life without even trying to project any kind of spiritual personality or spiritual ego onto that. Beautiful. Um, speaking of the body, pleasure. So the body likes pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say. Happiness of the body is pleasure. Or happiness of the world is contentment. And happiness of the spirit is joy. And uh, so the Buddha actually tried a path of, there was a belief in those days that if you hurt your body, you torment your body, then you burn your karma faster. So he actually tried that. He tried uh, fasting. He tried, uh, you know, hurting himself. Um, some people still do this kind of practice. And what he got at the end of that, first of all, of course, he got a lot of pain and suffering. But what he got, one time he actually, he was so starved. He said he could actually feel, when he put his hand on his belly, he could feel a spinal column. That's how, that's how emaciated he was. And he was walking and he got dizzy and he fell. And you can imagine how painful it is to fall when you're nothing but bonds. And it occurred to him that this body is innocent. This body is just innocent. It's like a little baby. We talked about money being like a little baby. This body is also so innocent. So why am I tormenting this body so much? And he got it. This, this is the wrong path. Yes. And we should actually question. All of you should question what I'm also saying. Because I may be slipping in things that may be false. So you should question. Buddha also questioned. I got this uh, information that I tormenting the body is supposed to be good. But no, this seems like the wrong path. So he gave up that path. And instantly his five friends left him. They said, oh, you've given up. You've taken the path of luxury. But the Buddha said, it's not the path of luxury. Just keep the body in moderation. The real pleasure actually is moderation, isn't it? Not too hot, not too cold. Not overstuffing yourself, not starving yourself. Mm. You know, not, not drinking too much water, not drinking no water at all, just being a bit. That also is not good. So moderation, there's real pleasure in moderation. Eat the right amount, sleep the right amount, exercise the right amount. Overdoing anything will throw us off. And don't be afraid of pleasure, but be mindful, be aware. And you realize that pleasure is a changing thing. That what, like, for example, you like, you come to my place, I give you some nice food. You love the food, such good food, Nitya. You come again, I give you the same food. Oh, thanks. Third day, <laughs> okay, I was getting a bit much, same food. <laughs> Every day, you see the same pleasure doesn't satisfy us. What we thought gives us such satisfaction, after a while, the same thing doesn't satisfy us anymore. You watch a great movie. How many times will you watch it? Again and again? Yeah. If you've got a great appetite, you can watch it 20, 30 times. But beyond a point, okay, enough. I know every part of this movie now. So pleasure gives you diminishing returns. This is the problem with pleasure. The pleasure cannot be sustained. You require the next hit, the next high every single time. So pleasure is good, but pleasure cannot be the ultimate. Yeah. So we take care of the body. And uh, we keep it in reasonable comfort. But we also are willing to sweat it out sometimes. We're willing to once in a while go on a camp, go on a trek. Don't have such a comfortable bed. Let there be a few mosquitoes there. Maybe your food will be delayed. Maybe it'll be cold. And we need that. We need to also be a little bit hardy. We shouldn't be afraid of a little bit of physical discomfort. And mm -hmm. this keeps us in, in good balance. Anger. Anger actually is very connected to expectation. Anger is frustrated expectation. So it's a desire held tightly, which has now gotten frustrated. You should be a certain way. People should be a but this is like expect this is like normal. This has to happen. How can you not? Right. So it's an expectation. It's a desire. Your expectation is a desire you're holding tight. And now it's gotten frustrated, it hasn't happened. This is anger. A friend of mine once told me that when he gets angry, he asks himself, what might be 10,000 reasons why someone did that? No one is going to think of 10,000. But he said, even if I think of two or three, I calm down. Why? Because I was imagining the person is so bad, so wrong. When I do things, I have very good excuses. When they do it, it's, it's an unbelievably cruel and terrible. Right? The Buddha says, if you knew the full story of someone, it would be impossible for you to get angry. You're getting angry at your waiter. But do you know what he's been through that morning? He might have been stuck in traffic. Uh, he might have hurt himself on his bike. Uh, he might be just coming out of the uh, kitchen with a chef shouting at him. He may not be able to pay his bills. So that's not my problem. It's not your problem, but it's understandable. If you were in that same situation, chances are you also might be a little inattentive. You also might slip up a little bit. So compassion is giving the benefit of the doubt. The way to come out of anger, give the benefit of the doubt instead of the benefit of the shout. <laughs> so because the truth is we are all carrying a heavy burden, whether it appears like it or not. Every single one of us, you cannot be in this human realm without carrying a heavy burden. Of course, some of us try to project that all is well and everything is fine, but everyone's carrying a hidden burden. 
Now, the question you have to ask yourself is, as you go through life, are you going to add to their burden or are you going to lighten the load? Mm -hmm. And so anger is definitely a way to add to the burden. Sometimes it is required to do an act of anger because people don't listen to anything else. Like as a child, you're trying to get your child to listen. You're trying to get an employee to listen. Okay, you have to do an act of anger. You have to pretend to be angry because then nothing else is getting their attention. But behind that kind of act of anger is actually only wishing well. You want the best for that person, that child or whoever it is. And that has to be the last resort. That cannot be the first resort. So if you're in the habit of flying off your handle every single time, uh, this is actually very damaging to you at all levels. We all know. Of course, you're not saying anger is automatically a bad thing. Anger is one of the emotions like every other emotion. However, tremendous amount of energy. Have you seen just one shout? How much energy goes in that? You'll probably be vibrating for a long time after that. You'll be shaking. So, and other people will be shaking. So as far as possible, we need to be mindful. We need to catch the anger many steps before it comes to that level. And what I've simply learned is time out. Take a moment. Learn to know when you're emotionally activated. Something will, it's like a switch goes off in your brain. Tuck. You'll actually feel it. If you're attending, oh, something went off. How can they say that? How can they do that? How can it happen? That switch has gone off. Now catch it. Catch it right there. Don't say anything. Don't do anything. Like the police say in the US, you have the right to remain silent. <laughs> do not say anything at that point. It's going to be used against you. You're going to, it's going to, you'll have to apologize at some point. It's going to backfire at some point. Right. So I would say come back to a place of, let me respond from a place of a little bit, being a little bit more centered, a little bit more calm. And that may take five minutes, 10 minutes. Do something else. Take a few deep breaths, drink a glass of water. These simple suggestions like drink a glass of water, count to 10, actually it works. Because if you, if you react in that moment, it's going to make things worse. Mm. So we all need to learn to recognize when are you emotionally activated? When are you not? Give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Go slow. And chances are you'll not have to have too much of anger and frustration in your life. Lovely. Community 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 is um, is our togetherness of course it's our tribe community is one is of course the one you're born into you might be born into a certain part of the world a certain religion um, a certain kind of your parents might be part of certain occupational community maybe doctors they may be lawyers that's what you just get automatically and if it resonates completely, good, good for you. Your religion resonates, uh, the people you live with, your neighbors resonate. That, that's the kind of automatic community. But then there is the community that you choose. And sometimes that's a little different. Like I chose to go and live with, a monk, with monks. So I kind of chose a different community. I invite people to, who are interested in these kinds of things to come and connect with me sometime. We meet once a week, we have a call, or we meet a few times, a few, every few months, we have a retreat of some kind. So people who are on a similar wavelength, it's nice. It's you, you can just be yourself. You don't have to pretend to be anything. You don't have to pretend to be something you're not. And that's the value of community. And I think they found very strong research from the blue zones of the world. Blue zones are places where people tend to live over 100 more often than other places. So these kinds of places, community is one of the major elements for living a long, healthy life. So you would imagine it's health, it's exercise, it's diet, it's not smoking and drinking. And those are important things. But nothing matches community. Nothing matches what they call social integration. Your feeling of connectedness with others. Your feeling of there are other people to look out, look out for me. I'm here to look out for them. They're here to look out for me. So you will often have a higher quality of life in a smaller, living in a smaller town where you tend to know people, uh, where you tend to uh, connect more one-to-one -one with people. In cities, we often don't even know our neighbors. Even though there are more people in the city, you actually know less people sometimes. But in smaller communities, you tend to know your baker, you tend to know the doctor, you tend to know uh, the person who delivers your milk, everything. You tend to know everybody. And then you, you have a little bit more space to talk to them. You're the postman. You'll not just take the letter. How's it going? How's your day today? Mm -hmm. And those little interactions count. So I would say get clear about your values. Get clear about what's important to you. And if you're not getting it in your automatic community, which is the one you were born into, then you can actually choose to create community. And there are, thanks to the internet now, you can very quickly search. Like if I'm interested in board games, I can very quickly search people interested in board games. I can search people interested in Frisbee, people interested in pickleball, uh, people interested in meditation. And very quickly I can find, in a matter of minutes, I can find people with similar interests. I heard about this lady, 
her mother's Japanese and her mother's getting old. So he gets her mother to move into her town. Now, in a way, this uproots her mother because her mother had all her connections were in the earlier town. Now, you would say this is so bad because at, at an old age, this woman has no new friends now. But she's very smart. She doesn't give up. The mother, she's Japanese. She goes to the local Japanese restaurant and she writes a note and gives it to the owner saying, if, they, if you meet people who are around my, around my age, give them my number. Say, I've newly moved here and I'd love to connect. And the owner said, I'll be happy to. So within a few days, she's getting calls. <laughs> and her daughter's surprised that her mother now knows more people than she knows. They're like, what is this mom? And you've just barely come here. And every day you're getting invited here, getting invited there. Because she was proactive about it. She didn't wait to say, oh, what will happen? Hmm. I moved to a small town in Utah. I lived there for several months of the year for a while. And I didn't know anybody there. But I just began connecting with people who had similar interests. And before I knew it, I mean, I'd go to the supermarket, people would wave to me. And they'd know me and I'd know them. Because I made that I was a little proactive about finding community, finding people in the same wavelength. And this is important for us. And especially in today's world, where there is such a lot of uh, frustration that we have, and we have mistrust of other people. Mm. Part of it is because we are not comfortable in our own community, and we haven't been conscious about the community we've created. So community is important. I. I? The individualized I. I is sometimes seen as a really bad thing uh, in the spiritual world, but I don't think it is. Uh, we have to have a healthy ego uh, in order to look beyond the ego. A uh, fruit has to ripen well on a tree before it can fall off. So first of all, we have to have good self-esteem, uh, self-worth. We do that by uh, appreciating ourselves, um, focusing on our good qualities, uh, looking back at our life and seeing all the ways in which we have been altruistic, done good for ourselves and others, done the best we could. Instead of negatively comparing ourselves, oh, I'm not good at this, I'm not bad, I'm not good at that. That kind of thinking doesn't help. So first, having a healthy sense of I, healthy sense of uh, who I am. However, that is based on stories. That is based on ideas from the past and ideas about the future and roles that you play and how well you play them. So that can never be a lasting solution because that's a little bit unstable. Because the next time someone comes in, um, they criticize you or they accuse you of something or they abandon you, then, then all that gets very shaken. So we need to find a deeper I. So the deeper I would be I am. I am is uh, like right now I am speaking. Or I mean, you, when you, I am listening to what you're saying. Uh, or I am uh, someone who's now seeing what's in this room. So with every experience, there's always an I am attached to it. And we tend to go with what's after the I am. Oh, I am angry. I'm happy. I'm peaceful. I'm sad. I'm enthusiastic. I'm joyful. But we forget the I am. So one of the main teachings is to come back to this I am. This I am actually is a very, it's like a very invisible thing. You can't really place it. You can't really get a hold of it. So this is the deeper sense of I am. And even deeper than this I am is simply I. And that's the, that's the deeper meaning of I, which is even beyond the I am. The I beyond the I am. And this would be sometimes called the true self. Um, and maybe even that at some level is not the ultimate, who knows. Uh, but we we come to these subtler states. One is the expression of this I in the normal sense I use the word I and being comfortable with that. Then coming to awareness and then coming to what's prior to awareness, before awareness. Because even this awareness began with birth and may not be there after death. So what is before that? What is prior to that? And this is a journey of, uh, in a way, don't we do everything for the I? If you look at your life, everything you're doing is for the I only, right? You can pretend to be altruistic or whatever, but ultimately... We want to enhance our sense of I. We want good reputation. We want a comfort. We want a you know, good future. We want to live in a good world. Ultimately, it's about I. We recognize how basically selfish we are. So if you are that selfish, doesn't it require, doesn't the I require some attention? Who is this I? What is this I? What am I assuming this I to be? So this needs to be, who am I, needs to be an important question we all ask. And it's not a question with a very quick answer you can get from my teaching or some book. It has to be a living question. How is the eye showing up now? What is, how is the eye getting flattered now? How is the eye getting offended now? How, is the, how are my defense mechanisms coming up? I notice when someone is criticizing me or in my defense mechanism, oh, I'm, I'm rationalizing, I'm projecting. Defense, oh, this eye wants to be protected. What is this eye that wants to be protected? So this is the main thing, the eye, the journey of the eye. From the small eye to the big eye. <laughs> Death. 
death is what got me interested in uh, spirituality maybe in some way my father died when i was 7 years old so maybe at some level that shook me up he was only 38 years old or something and then i learned meditation at the age of 16 17 and the recognition of impermanence that shook me up like this life is just passing by breath by breath is just going i got an image of a sinking ship you know the titanic was sinking the lower decks go first but eventually the whole ship is going to sink so you look all around you people are sinking but you i am on the upper deck it's going to sink so i got a very clear perception i'm going to die mm-hmm. what am i doing with my life and this in my case led to a kind of disenchantment there the word in called in pali vairagya sanskrit in pali vairagya a sense of disenchantment what is this world about so death is what spurred me towards uh, looking deeper within and asking some fundamental questions what's important to me and taking the decision in my case i'm fortunate i didn't just remain intellectual i took some big decision i left my job i had a good corporate job i left that i went ahead and went to a different country went to a monastery forest monastery uh took on a whole different way of life but at some level what really shifted it was a deep acceptance i was trying to control it i was trying to say okay let me let me practice well so i have a good death but the more i practice the more you see the more you try to run towards something at some level the more it the more what do you say elusive it is Mm. running towards anything or even running away from something the more you run away from something at some level you attract it the more you run towards something at some level it eludes you mm. so in my case i realized that i actually the real answer is not getting some kind of superpower where death i'm immune to death or death doesn't affect me it is embracing that i don't know how i'm going to die will i die in a peaceful way in an unpeaceful way will i die in an accident will i die through a disease will i have a graceful death will i have an unpleasant i don't know that what will be my mind state i don't know that i could get dementia i could get alzheimer's who knows will there be people to look after me or not and i don't know what kind of afterlife is going to happen based on that so a very deep sense of acceptance that i don't know i can't control this but whatever happens in my case what helped me was wherever i go whatever happens may i be of service may i it was almost like a bodhisattva idea that wherever i go exactly. may i be may i be a channel of blessings in a sense and in my case that was what dissolved it what dissolved a big chunk of this painful concept that i had that i would this death question was a big big riddle big puzzle for me and the sense that whatever it is however it shows up i accept it bring it on and wherever i go may i be a channel of blessings in my case that dissolved the bulk of it and um, you cannot actually have a good life unless you have made some level of peace with death otherwise you just at a, at a subtle level you're running you're escaping through all your business through all your work through all your parties at some level you're trying to cover up and it'll always be shallow it'll always be shallow you've not touched that depth so no matter how outwardly how good things are there's a deep festering uh, pain and discomfort below that you only you can only cover 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 and how good it is to just make peace with it buddha says exhale subject to old age have not gone beyond old age subject to sickness not gone beyond sickness subject to death not gone beyond death all that is mine beloved and pleasing will be will become otherwise will be separated from me i am the heir to my actions whatever actions i do for good or for ill of that i am the heir in this way these are like bitter pills to swallow this is a world where we're running after botox and running after you know filling our little wrinkles and putting on anti aging cream and all kinds of stuff but okay you can do it put it on but know that ultimately you cannot escape this <laughs> right you can only cover it up i would like everyone listening to this this talk of ours i would like you to age gracefully accept it don't don't try to hide it accept it accept your wrinkles accept your slowed down metabolism your memory will also begin to fade at some point how wonderful bring it on bring it on and gracefully go into this there's an arising and there's a passing you were graceful with the arising now be graceful with the passing as well and in this way we can make peace with death beautiful so profound the last one divinity divinity is what we it is beyond what we can conceive and it is beyond what you can see and hear and smell and taste and touch and also think so it is the inconceivable 
And the moment it's inconceivable, then many people will say, oh, but then that can't be proved. But there are many things which uh, are there in this world which we can't really prove. Like, for example, how do you prove love? <laughs> love is something very hard to define, very, but love is there. We know what, you know, when food is prepared with love, it tastes a certain way. It's that X ingredient. If it's prepared to just fill your belly, that's a different thing. But if it's prepared to with love, it has a different element. If I'm giving this talk with a certain amount of love, it'll have a certain effect. If I'm just trying to get out, get done with it, it'll have the same answers, but it'll be missing that X element of love, that quality of love. So like this, divinity is something which it is an unknown, it is an undefinable, it, is an, it cannot be perceived, cannot be conceived, and yet it is very active. It is highly active. It is the foundation of everything. One way, you can use the word God, for example, G-O-D, God, the grand overall design. It is that which animates everything. It is the intelligence that animates everything. So it's not necessary to have a concept of uh, divinity or God in our life, I feel. Uh, if you just live in a very natural way, if whatever you do, for example, you're a teacher, you teach wholeheartedly. If you, if you prepare food for your family, you cook wholeheartedly. Uh, if you're cleaning your home, you clean it with a lot of love, with a lot of attention. That X factor is present and you will start to divinize everything. And you will gently, slowly and steadily start to look beyond just your little eye. You will have a sense of affinity with everyone and everything around you. You will feel a oneness with everyone and everything around you. And little by little, as it gets more and more subtle, you will have a sense of this. And there'll be a beautiful shift from personality to presence. Personality is I am doing, I am Nityashanti, I am a teacher, I do this. I, to presence, it's like, oh, something is happening. Something is happening through me. So more and more it's happening through me. This, this, these answers are coming through me. I'm also listening to these answers very fascinating. Oh, where are these answers coming from? It's coming through me. And at some point, even the sense of it is coming through me, this separation also begins to dissolve. And it just is. It just is. It's like it's happening. Things are happening. And uh, this is where it gets very fascinating because at one level, it's completely out of control. Like I have no clue what I'm going to say next. And it's completely out of control and it's completely symmetric. It's completely aligned. So this is the opposite of what we expect. It's like nature never hurries, but everything gets done. It's like no matter how you, how you drop things, they fall in exactly the right place. This is a sense that nothing is out of place Everything is happening exactly the right way. I cannot answer any question wrong. No question you ask me is wrong. Nothing, I, no answer I give is wrong. No reaction to my answer is wrong. If you like my answer, good. If you don't like my answer, good. If you're bored, that's also good. It's all good, in other words. Everything is happening exactly the way it should. This is a very deep level of, you could call it cohesion. You could call it symmetry. You could call it alignment. And this is the active and dynamic aspect of that divinity. And so both the active aspect, which is the way life is unfolding, and the passive aspect, which is that which is witnesses, that which is knows. Right now, something in you is, is able to see this or hear this. What is that? That's a question mark. You can't really name it. So in some sense, it's all the play of the divine. All of this is the play of the divine. And the more you can see it as a play of the divine, we talked about playfulness earlier. Yes. You lighten up, lighten up, lighten up. Don't take it so seriously. The Buddha's teaching can be summarized in these three fun phrases. One is everything changes. Anicca. Sometimes that hurts. Dukkha. Don't take it personally. Anatta. <laughs> so it changes. It can sometimes hurt. Don't take it personally. And uh, go through this life in a more shift from personality to presence. How do you do that? By doing things wholeheartedly. I don't know why an organization, the, the top of the organization, what do you call it? The headquarters. Why quarter of the head? Why headquarters? Why not wholehearted? <laughs> right? So, yeah, why, why is that? So, uh, to change the model in which we approach, our, our, why, why this gap between professionalism and personal, professional life, personal life, why this gap? Why can't I bring my emotions to work? Why can't I be real about it? Why do I have to pretend to be all okay? This is artificial divisions we are creating. And this is actually messing people up. We talk about mental health and all of that. It's because we've divided our life, chopped it up into so many different pieces. So becoming whole again, becoming human again, recognizing that you're okay, exactly the way you're showing up. You don't have to match some idea of what the world tells you you have to be. So embracing the light and the dark in you. And in this way, your, light starts, your life starts to shine. A certain 
indescribable quality of the divine starts to shine through you. And wherever you go, whatever you do, it's just right. It's not too much, it's not too little. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. This was really uh, interesting. I didn't know what we would end up with uh, having an interview in this format. But yeah. as you said, it's all perfect. Uh, before I let you go, um, I'm sure there would be many people interested in learning more, connecting with you, if you could just share some of the ways in which people can reach you. I guess these days they can find me on social media, uh, in Instagram, look up Nitishanti, at Nitishanti. I spell Nitya with an H, N-I-T-H-S-H. There's a website, nitishanti.com. What else is there? Your podcasts, your shows. Podcasts, yeah, there, there's a round glass. Search for round glass, round dot glass. Or search for the app, Round Glass Living app. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of very good quality content on Round Glass. YouTube has got a lot of stuff. I post regularly on YouTube. And of course, we have a book. Share, share, the, share the book that we wrote. Have you shared it? Right? Yes, this, this is, is the, the book. book. It's we have an audio books. book. So the book is another way. And ultimately, as you know, as we've been saying, all of these ways are... Because I like to make myself as transparent and redundant as possible. So use all of this. Like even don't even be in a rush to go and check out my Instagram. Have you even absorbed what we talked about? We've talked about a lot of fascinating stuff in this talk itself. There's a real uh, desire for information these days. Yes. So I would say just, it's okay. Whenever you're ready, you can get in touch with Nandini, get in touch with me, check out the book, do other things. But don't be in a rush for the next thing, next thing, next thing. Let us shift from information to digesting what has touched us. Even what has happened in this short exchange, uh, some beautiful seeds have been planted. And whether or not people connect with me ever again, those seeds will have a life of their own. And they will lead you back to the intelligence that is native to you, a certain authenticity, a certain simplicity. And it will express itself differently in you as it will in me. So you may not live and think and behave the way I do, which is what we tend to do. Sometimes you like some teachers, we tend to start dressing like them, talking like them, behaving like them. And I think at some level, that's something you'll have to unlearn. Uh, you'll have to come back. I had to unlearn a lot of things that I've picked up and I'm continuing to do so. And more and more stepping into the full audacity of how life wants to show up through me. So yeah, that's what I suggest. Beautiful. I was saying that I noticed, uh, you know, almost a lack of interest in really marketing <laughs> any of the things. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it is this lightness, you know, it is this lightness that uh, uh, almost works counterintuitively because more and more people then do. I'm using work. reverse psychology. I'm using reverse psychology. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you're using, uh, the bottom line <laughs> is that you are touching a lot of people's lives. And, uh, and I'm truly grateful and thankful that uh, you took the time to do this and I'm sure our audiences are going to absolutely enjoy it. So thank you so much. Lovely. Thank you so much, Nandini. Lovely to be here with all of you. Lots of love.